we'll continue our study in Romans 1. Might be slightly inconventional today. We're only going to do a verse and a half of another verse so for time's sake. I don't think Brother Larry would appreciate me taking this preaching hour to do the whole, <laughs> the whole text after that. We'll go ahead and read verses 28 through 31 so we can get the whole context. But if you recall from last week, Paul was describing, or continuing to describe the downward trajectory of man and how the man came to do that which was even against nature. Verse 28, he starts to get a little more specific and detailed rather than a broad overview. He says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignancy, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, spiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without natural, or excuse me, without understanding, covetousness, without natural affection, Implacable, unmerciful. Mm -hmm. Here he describes really the whole gambit, if you will, of the wickedness of man. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll begin in verse 28 here. And he says that even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, mm-hmm. here is really the true state of the atheist. Yeah. Not that he doesn't believe in God, but he doesn't like. But there is a God. Right. It? It's not that he says that he says verbally there is no God. Within him he knows there is a God, yet he doesn't want there to be a God. That's it. But the natural man does not like that there is a God that he is going to be accountable to. Amen. Yeah. And I believe that's what atheism as well as all these false gods ultimately come down to is they want a God that they don't have to be accountable to them. Mm-hmm. That's not going to judge them for their sins. <clears throat> Man loves his wickedness, and it's it. apart from the grace of God, he will not let go of that. It says that he doesn't even like to retain, that is, to have or possess the fact that there is a God. Mm-hmm. He could have it his way, he would wipe off any knowledge of God from his conscience. That that is the one, the one thing I guess that you say remains from before the fall is that man has this conscience that tells him there is a God. Amen. Well, they do not like to even retain God in their knowledge. Well, we see this very plainly in our society when they tried to wipe out God from schools and governments and. Even any mention of God in the workplace or wherever it may be, well, they don't mind too much that we're Christians as long as we don't tell them about it. Right. Because they don't like to even acknowledge the God of the Bible. But he says, because of this, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Right. This reprobate mind means one that's. <laughs> Rejected is worthless. A mind that has rejected God is and is morally worthless. Some many commentators say they're lacking judgment in the things of God. Some even some of our brethren would say that you can reject God enough that God will eventually reject you. Hmm. Or that you can get far enough away from God that he will reject you. But I don't find that to be true. Amen. Yes, one day all the unbelievers will be cast alive in the lake of fire, but no one is too far for the the grace of God to reach. Amen. Not the most wicked of men, not the most abominable, but this reprobate mind is really one that is bent against God. Mm -hmm. One that rejects rejects God, rejects God's word, 
doesn't want anything to do with God. Well, I want us to look at a few places where this word reprobate is used. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Second Corinthians chapter 13, we'll look at verses 5 through 7. First part of this verse we probably are familiar with. It says, examine yourself that you be in the faith, prove your own selves. And he tells them that we ought to make sure we are in the faith. Amen. But we ought to truly know that we have been saved. Notice the last part here, he says, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Oh, that the Christ was not in us, we would be reprobate. Mm -hmm. But he goes on to say in verse 6, But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. We be sure if we are saved, we are not in this state of being a reprobate. We are not a truly saved person does not reject God and his word. Amen. And certainly will not be rejected by God. Christ fairly clearly said, All that come to me, I will no wise cast out. Amen. Verse 7, he goes on to say, Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that we should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. He is saying that we need to conduct our lives in a way that we don't appear to be as the reprobates are. That we don't appear to be as the hypocrites are either. So we, if we're truly saved, we cannot be truly reprobate or rejected in the sight of God, but we can live like we are. Right. We can live like we are an unsaved person, but we never should as a child of God. We turn over to 1 Corinthians 9, we'll see it again, Paul. Oh, here uses that same word, which gets translated as castaway here. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27. It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. Amen. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring to subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul tells us about the race that we have to run, how the Christian life is like a fight that we are to fight. Mm -hmm. Notice in verse 27, he says that he has to keep his body and bring it into subjection. That is, he has to discipline his body to will. Amen. Otherwise, he says, when he preaches, he will appear as a castaway or as a reprobate, as a, a lost person. He doesn't keep his flesh in line. Mm -hmm. I know that particular teaching is discarded in many churches today. You're right. Yet we are to keep our body, our flesh, our natural man disciplined, so that we're in check, you could say. Amen. Otherwise, we will really become an unprofitable servant. Yeah. We cannot be used in service of God when we are living in sin. Amen. We are not. We cannot tell others about the grace of God when we are living as if it never has changed us. You're right. Amen. That is what Paul is warning about here. We'll turn one more place in Titus. Titus chapter 1. <laughs> but if you, as you can see, uh, the use of that word reprobate or cast away is always in the context of an unsaved person. Right. 
notice those here are another group of unsaved folks in verse 15 and 16 of Titus chapter 1. It says, Under the pure, all things are pure. And under them that are defiled and unbelieving, is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Mm -hmm. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Amen. Abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Good. But they, he says, they were abominable, they were disobedient, they were reprobate. <laughs> that is the state of an unsaved person. Even if they honor God with their lips, and Christ said there were some that honor God with their lips, but their hearts are far from them. Right. That's what these people were here. They said so they knew God, but the way they lived, they rejected God. But if we are not careful, we will can be in the same state. Where we we say that we love God. We say that we've been born again, and yet we don't live as if we do. Right. Or if we ever have been saved. That is use of the word reprobate here. It's an unsaved person or unsaved, unchanged mind that is bent against God. But it is never outside the reach of God's grace. Amen. So if we're not careful, though, we can live as if we are this reprobate. That's why is it important to seek after godliness, holiness. In fact, Titus in the later part of the book there, Paul says that the grace of God teaches us that we should live godly, soberly, righteously. Well, I'm not going to start go down a rabbit trail and start preaching, but we are, there is a problem among American Christianity of living godly. You're right. Amen. We shouldn't go the far extreme where we become legalistic, but we can't go the other extreme where it, anything goes and as long as you love Jesus, you're okay. There you go. But he did call us to live according to his commands. Let's go back to our text in Romans chapter 1. One said so he gave them over to this reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. For convenient means those things which are not fitting or becoming or not appropriate. We oftentimes use the word convenient to talk about in Walmart or something. It's convenient because you can go get everything you need there. Right. Toothpaste, milk, oil change, whatever it is. <laughs> But it also means a, something that fits in or something that's appropriate, such as you make a doctor's appointment at a time that's convenient for you. Mm -hmm. Paul says these here are doing those things which are not appropriate. They're not becoming of a child of God or they're certainly not fitting in with the standard of God's word. Amen. And that's when he begins to list a pretty comprehensive list over the next several verses and we'll look at the first three of these this morning and then we'll Lord willing we'll look at the rest of them next week or maybe two weeks but verse 29 we'll go on here he says being filled with all unrighteousness and all these things are in the heart of man without the restrained hand of God man would run fully towards them you're right First, he says, being filled with all unrighteousness, that is, moral wrongfulness, that is, that which is not right before God. That could be in two ways, both in our position with God, that we are not right before Him, or it could be in practice, doing that which is not right before Him. Right. Both of those things fall under unrighteousness. You can be sure it's that which displeases God is unrighteous. Amen. He says man is filled with it. He doesn't just have a little smudge on his exterior, does he? It says he's affected by this unrighteousness in every part of his being. Amen. Let's go to back to Isaiah for just a moment. Isaiah chapter 1, he's describing really the state of Israel at this point. Isaiah 
Isaac, I mean, excuse me, Israel had really turned towards wickedness and turned from God. This describes really man when he's left to himself, exactly what happens. Verse number six says, from the sole of the foot, even under the head, there is no soundness in it, but women Amen. and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointments. Man has been completely affected by this unrighteousness, so from the head of his, from the top of his head to the sole of his foot. So he doesn't just have a, a broke arm or need of repair. He's, doesn't just have a, a cold and needs some time to get over it. He's been completely corrupted mm -hmm. by this unrighteousness. But we do have a promise to God, from God. We'll get to that in just a moment. But first Corinthians, or excuse me, first John, chapter five, verse seventeen, we don't have to turn there, but it says all unrighteousness is sin. You can be sure that all Anything that's not right in the eyes of God, that it is sin. Amen. But we do have this promise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1 9. A man in his natural state is quite helpless, isn't he? Quite hopeless. Mm -hmm. Yet with Christ, there is hope. A man. He's not going to be able to turn himself around and become righteous in himself. That's it. Isaiah, in another place later, says that all our righteousness are as filthy rags. So even if we do have some good works within us, that even that has been tainted by sin. You're right. Yet, through the person of Christ, we can be cleansed from all that unrighteousness. Outside of Christ, everyone. Even the quote best of people are unrighteous before God. You're right. That's really only through Christ that we can be righteous before Him. Getting off again a little bit of a rabbit hole, but the Pharisees, they were very self righteous people, weren't they? Mm -hmm. They thought that they were righteous and good to go, and they were the cream of the crop, if you will. But we see. In the example of Paul, that they, their righteousness still wasn't enough to be right before God. Right. Amen. Well, Paul would later say that that righteousness and all that he had that came with it, he counted but dumb. They may win Christ. That he didn't want to be found having his own righteousness, but the righteousness which is in Christ by faith. Well, we should strive to live righteously, but we should also recognize that our righteousness ultimately comes from Christ and not from ourselves. Are we going back to our text here? He goes on from saying, being filled with all unrighteousness, and he says fornication. Fornication is primarily harlotry in the scriptures, but that can be both physical and spiritual. Mm -hmm. Strictly speaking, we know fornication is a sexual relation between unmarried persons. Sometimes more loosely it's used to mean any illicit sexual relation, including adultery, sodomy, incest, and so on. But we know this physical fornication is not acceptable for the child of God. And it's Amen. It's still sin, despite what our society may say. We can turn to Ephesians for just a moment. We'll read one verse here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 3. Let's go ahead and read verse 1 through 3. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Mm -hmm. We see our command to follow God and how the Christ that gave himself the sacrifice for us. And he says in verse 3, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become of the saints. Amen. 
you familiar with the first Corinthian letter? They had a problem with fornication. And even a, such a fornication as a man with his own stepmother. Right. And Paul, yet they weren't dealing with it. Paul told them to deal with it the next time we come together. Amen. And society says it's acceptable, it's okay, it's even expected nowadays. Yet it's still sinful inside of God. That's it. Amen. But spiritually, we don't talk about spiritual fornication very much, but spiritually fornication is comes down to idolatry, going after other gods, right? Seeking other things before God. Just as if much like if Brother Larry was seeking another woman besides Donna, he would be in the wrong. We are no more right to seek things other than God, first and foremost. Right. Amen. Let's turn to Ezekiel. We'll see Ezekiel chapter 6, an example of, once again, the Israelites and their wickedness. Ezekiel chapter 6, we'll go ahead and read the first 10 verses to get the whole context. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face toward the mountains of Israel, and prophesy against them. And say, Ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains, and to the hills, and to the rivers, and to the valleys. Behold, I, even I, will bring a sword upon you, and I will destroy your high places, and your altars shall be desolate, and your images shall be broken, and I will cast down your slain men before your idols. And I will lay the dead carcasses of the children of Israel before their idols. I will scatter your bones round about your altars, and all your dwelling places in the and all your dwelling places, the cities shall be laid waste, and the high places shall be desolate, that your altars may be laid waste and made desolate, your idols may be broken and ceased, and your images may be cut down, and your works may be abolished, and the slain shall fall in the midst of you, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Amen. Notice verse 8. You know, God pronounces judgment upon sin, but he has mercy as well. Yet will I leave a remnant, that ye may have some that shall escape the sword among the nations, and ye shall be scattered through the countries. If you were called the history of Israel, they would be carried away and the ten northern tribes would be scattered throughout the world, never to be really heard of again until right. modern times. And eventually the southern kingdom would be scattered as well and because of their wickedness, he says, because of their idolatry, because of their spiritual fornication. Right. But yet he said he has a remnant. All throughout history he's had a remnant of that people. Even in the last days, shall once again Israel be saved. Let's go on to verse 9 here. It says, And they that escape of you shall remember me among the nations, whither they shall be carried captive, because I am broken with your whole for your whorish heart, which hath departed from me, and with your eyes which go a whoring after their idols, and they shall loathe themselves for the evils which they have committed in all their abominations. Amen. And they shall know that I am the Lord. And I have not said in vain that I will do this evil unto them. The spiritual fornication is not something we should just say, well, that was just the Israelites. That's just when you carve out an, an idol. Certainly they had their physical idols, but really anything that comes between us and God is a, becomes an idol to us. Amen. So whether it's family, jobs, money, possessions, cars, houses, those are common things in our society. There's even some churches that almost literally worship those things. And hey man, you're right. People just call them that up, don't they? They want the health and the wealth, prosperity. But yet, God will judge those things. He's not going to take lightly, especially us as his people, if we go whoring after other gods, as it says mm -hmm. here. But he does have mercy. We can thank him for that. Amen. Let's go back 
to our text in Romans chapter 1, and we'll close. You see, the third thing listed here is wickedness. Wickedness as depravity. It's, it's very similar to unrighteousness, but it goes beyond just being not right with God. It really goes down deep and to point to the corrupt nature of man. Mm-hmm. You know, each and every one of us at times do things which are not right before God. But if we've truly been saved, He has given us a new nature. We got the unsaved, they are still fully in this wickedness or this You're depravity. Right. This word also indicates what's legally called malicious intent. It's right. purposely intending to do evil. The difference between the child of God and the unsaved is at least we we struggle with sin, don't we? We mm-hmm. grieve over our sins. We oftentimes like are as Paul in Romans seven, struggling to do that which is good and find <coughs> ourselves doing that which is evil. Mm-hmm. But the wicked they don't have this type of struggle within them. Right. They're completely corrupt and they're okay with it. They don't anything they're purposefully seeking after this wickedness. Right. That is the state of man. We'll look at two verses in the Gospel and we'll close. Luke chapter 11. Adam and I were talking about eating with unwashed hands the other night. (laughs) The Pharisees that ridiculed the disciples for doing that. Here, Christ each without being washed, and the, the Pharisee was with marbles, it says. So Luke 11, verse 37 through 39. It says, And as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him, and he went in and sat down to meet. When the Pharisee saw, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. In the place where the group of Pharisees ridiculed the disciples. Christ said, it's not what goes in the mouth that defiles a man, it's what comes out that defiles a man. Right. So to eat with unwashed hands is not what defiles the person. Amen. But what's within the heart of man, that's what defiles a person. So Christ here, he sits down, not washing as was the, the tradition. But verse 39 says, and the Lord said unto him, now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness? It's like you get a little dirty cup, and you don't just wash the outside and leave the inside dirty, do you? Right. Yeah, that's exactly what the Pharisees did. They cleaned up the outside, but the inside was still corrupt. He says here it was full of ravening and wickedness. You know, the man can clean up his exterior a little bit. He can try to be a good person, but he's never been saved by the grace of God and he is still just as much corrupt on the inside. Amen. And really just as useful as a, a clean on the outside, dirty on the inside cup is, so is a person who is clean on the outside and corrupt on the inside. Right. Turn over to Matthew 23 and Christ says a very similar thing to the Pharisees once again. The Pharisees were very self-righteous. They really thought themselves to be something, but inwardly they were still just as wicked and depraved right. as any other lost person. Matthew 23, verses 25 through 27. Get the right chapter here. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that ye may that the outside of them may be clean also. So he uses the same analogy here of washing a cup and plate to wash the inside first. That's the more important part than the outside. Amen. Verse 27, he goes on to say, Woe. Unto ye, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto white sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and all 
on cleanness. Mm -hmm. Verse 28 says, Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Amen. These Pharisees said they really looked good to the average person, but God knew their hearts. God knew that within they were still wicked, as it says here, full of uncleanness, full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And so is every person who is striving to save themselves by good works. Right. Amen. So they may be a, what we would think of as a good person. They may have a good moral character. They may be a good citizen. They may do a lot of charitable deeds. But if they've never truly been born again, they are still corrupt within them. Amen. You're right. He says they're just as just as these white sepulchers were. They were very beautiful to look upon, but you didn't want to see what was inside. Mm -hmm. Man doesn't like to, to think of himself that way, but that's exactly how he is without Christ. Amen. He said he may be nice to look upon on the outside, but Without the grace of God, he is wicked and corrupt and vile within. So that's just the first few points of what Paul makes on the wickedness of man, the depravity of man. But Lord willing, we'll continue on this list next week. We're going to close with that thought. Amen.